Welcome to the Extended Bench, your YouTube home for all things rugby league news, analysis, history, and opinion. Subscribe so you don't miss a video and give us a thumbs up. The Extended Bench is part of the Rugby League Monthly Network, which includes a monthly online digital magazine available at rugbyleaguemonthly.com and the daily podcast Rugby League Daily, which airs during the NRL season. All links are down below in the description. Let's get into it. It's the 29th of August, 1895, and at the George Hotel in Huddersfield, England, 22 clubs from the Rugby Football Union have met to establish the Northern Rugby Football Union. The game of rugby league is born, but that's the end of this story. Plenty of water has passed under the bridge since then. So just how did we get to the formation of the Northern Rugby Football Union? Let me take you back to 1871, when the Rugby Football Union was formed. Rugby had split from association football, which we know as soccer today. And it was in the north of England that the game of rugby really took hold, particularly in the counties of Lancashire and Yorkshire. But this was something of an issue for the players based in the north. They were predominantly working class people, and the game was amateur, meaning players couldn't officially be paid for taking the field. Working class players had to be careful about how hard they played, because injuries meant they had to pay their own medical bills or take time off work. Now, here's where it begins to get a little messy. In 1892, Bradford and Leeds, both in Yorkshire, were accused of paying players for missing work, thereby being professional. From here on in, the schism that sees rugby league split from rugby union is set in motion. But how we get there is a matter that has come under some debate recently. The commonly held and supported belief is that as more and more clubs from the working class north of England were fed up with being amateur, dissent towards the Southern clubs and the administration grew. They also accused the Southern clubs and the union itself of scheduling meetings midweek and trying to freeze the Northern clubs out of decisions surrounding how the game should be run. The administration of the union was, of course, based in London. However, a recent book by Tom Mather raises doubt on this long-held belief. And if you give me a moment... Here's the book. Rugby League is Born. Dissent and general unhappiness from northern clubs is not debated, but Mather suggests the decision to split was a more selfish decision than simply being paid for missing work, then known as broken time. You see, in 1885, soccer decided to become professional, and the game was experiencing massive growth in the north of England. It was managing to run two 16-team divisions. Rugby Union was dealing with a downturn in spectators and therefore income. They were only getting big crowds for a local derby or for a knockout cup competition called the Yorkshire Cup. Mather says that in 1892, 10 of the teams in Yorkshire decided to form themselves into an alliance in secret. The issue here was that they wanted to form a league that the 10 clubs themselves wanted to run and control. The local authorities and those in Twickenham down in London weren't going to allow that, which led to conflicts. Now in Lancashire, they set up a first, second and third division, but the league body in Lancashire was in full control of that, not the clubs, so it was permitted by the authorities in Twickenham. In the end, Yorkshire managed to run a 10-team competition that was administered by the governing body, but the rules were set out by a subcommittee comprising of one representative per club in the competition. And in the competition bylaws, it stated the two teams that finished last would be relegated, but will be able to reapply for readmission. At the end of the first season, the bottom two sides applied for readmission, and the other eight clubs permitted them back in, causing an outcry in Yorkshire. Essentially, the ten clubs were out for themselves. In Lancashire, the problem was professionalism. They had promotion and relegation, and so clubs began poaching players off each other by paying both broken time and actual wages. And as an aside here, Mather says that every club across the country was apparently paying broken time by now but in Lancashire, they were paying actual wages. In 1894, Leeds and Salford were both suspended for professionalism, which angered the senior clubs who wanted a fully professional league. Salford's secretary then threw more fuel on the fire, accusing five other clubs, Swinton, Tildesley, Rochdale Hornets, Broughton Rangers and Wigan, of professionalism. Mather claims broken time had nothing to do with this at all. He says the senior clubs in Lancashire and Yorkshire wanted to run their own professional game that wasn't controlled by London, and so they didn't have to play Southern clubs. In that way, they would get bigger crowds by only playing clubs in the North. 
It had nothing to do with the welfare of working class players in the north of England. They weren't trying to protect their incomes, they were trying to launch a professional competition and gain an on-field advantage by recruiting the best players by paying them. Now this is Mather's opinion backed by research he's conducted, mostly based on newspaper articles and contemporary accounts from the late 1800s. Rugby league historian Tony Collins disagrees though. He sees that view as being very narrow because he's too focused in on the 1890s and the handful of years before the schism. He says you have to look at the previous 20 years. In 1886, the Rugby Football Union introduced amateurism into the game, despite other codes all heading towards professionalism as an attempt to keep the game within the upper class. So in 1888, the Northern Club suggested broken time payments. Collins says the RFU imposing amateurism on the Northern Clubs was the driving force behind much of the anger from Yorkshire and Lancashire. Not only was the amateurism negatively impacting those Northern teams in terms of making it harder for them to field players, but it also impacted crowd sizes and therefore the finances of those clubs. Collins adds that contrary to Mather's statement that broken time payments were common, he says that they were common until 1886. Then the RFU brought in amateurism and outlawed any form of payments to players. Those found guilty of being paid would be suspended along with their club. Collins very much supports the position that Northern clubs breaking away was because of the imbalance between the upper and lower classes. The upper classes could afford to take time off work if they are injured, while those in the working class risked financial ruin if they were injured. Back to the timeline, and in 1893, George Boak and John Forsyth were signed by Huddersfield with plenty of suspicion around how they were recruited from Cummersdale Hornets. Ultimately, Huddersfield were found to have paid the players, and the club was suspended. By the time 1895 rolled around, clubs in Northern England were ready to split from the Rugby Football Union. Ten prominent Lancashire clubs met in Manchester on the 27th of August 1895 to agree that they would support Yorkshire splitting from the Union. On the 29th of August, 22 clubs met and formed the Northern Rugby Football Union. The clubs were Batley, Bradford, Brighouse Rangers, Broughton Rangers, Halifax, Huddersfield, Hull FC, Hunslet, Leeds, Lee, Livers Edge, Manningham, Oldham, Rochdale Hornets, Runcorn, Stockport, St Helens, Tildesley, Wakefield Trinity, Warrington, Widnes, and Wigan. The union took action by banning everyone in the breakaway from ever playing rugby union, and that included amateur players. This meant amateur clubs joined the new Northern Union, and by 1904, there were more affiliate clubs aligned with the Northern Union than the RFU. In many regards, the way the game formed in England has restricted its growth in not just the UK, but also throughout Europe. The Northern Union was virtually set up as an isolated competition, and even today it doesn't like playing teams from the South, let alone from outside England. The Super League clubs were more than happy to boot the Toronto Wolfpack from the competition when COVID hit, simply to save their own skin. They replaced the team from North America with Lee, a team from a small town in Manchester. Super League teams have also complained of having to host Catalans and Toulouse this season because they don't bring massive crowds with them. Rugby League wouldn't have existed if those 22 clubs didn't split from the RFU, but the fact it was split along class lines has an impact today. If only there was a way to pull Super Leagues, and indeed Rugby League's attitudes towards expansion, into the 21st century.